Alrighty guys, welcome back to another episode of Adventure Fit Radio. I am coming to you from Changu in Bali. So we are on our uh, on our Adventure Fit trip in Bali. We're going to be rocking Changu. We're going to be rocking the Gili Islands. And uh, yeah, look, I've got a bit of a tan rocking. I've uh, shaved uh, shaved my nipples, and I'm uh, I don't know why I said that. And I'm uh, and I'm ready to go. So I'm loving it, guys. This week on the uh, on the episode of Adventure Fit Radio, we have Dr. John Rusin. Now, I don't want to give too much away, but this man is quite possibly one of the smartest individuals I've ever heard talk. He's uh, he's right into the strength and conditioning field. And uh, if you listen closely, he mentions a word that uh, that Bill and I have never heard of, and uh, is quite extraordinary. So please, uh, please, please listen on. It's uh, it's Unreal Madrid. This week, guys, we are brought to you by Audible. So Audible, uh, it's an online uh, audiobook service. It has, I believe, over two hundred thousand worth, two hundred thousand books or so. And uh, I'm loving. I'm reading a book right now called The Way of the Peaceful Warrior, which our good friend Jared Fleming got me onto, and I'm absolutely loving it, guys. Really helps me get all that knowledge in, get a little bit more educated when I'm on the go. So if that for you, if that is something for you guys, then head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash radio, and you will get a free credit when you subscribe to their monthly uh, monthly subscription. It's fantastic. Guys, we are also brought to you by Quash Creative, which is an Elwood-based freelance design firm run by our mate, Sean Marsh. His sole aim is to solve business challenges with creative solutions, whether the solution is the new website, logo, or marketing strategy. If you come to him with a problem, he'll work out the most effective way to solve it. So, he won't bore you with technical jargon either. Just plain English. I just thought I'd let you know about that one. <laughs> um, guys, our offer is, if you mention Adventure Fit Radio, Sean will give you a free basic SEO report on your website or feedback on your existing brand. So head to www.quashcreative.com. That's Q-U-A-R-S-H creative.com. And, uh, and follow the prompts, my friends. Finally, we are brought to you by Adventure Fit Travel. So we are, like I said, currently on the Bali and Gili Islands trip. We have Thailand coming up as well. And Kokoda is just about to rock in a couple of weeks. So guys, if you feel like discovering the world, meeting some awesome people, staying relatively fit at the same time, head to www.adventurefittravel.com and you will get 10% off all merch if you join the mailing list there. All righty, without further ado, here's Dr. John Rusin. Alrighty, guys, welcome back to Adventure Fit Radio. We are here with the great Dr. John Russon today. We just uh, just clarified the pronunciation of the name, and it is definitely Russon, uh, <laughs> which I'm glad to uh, glad to have got that off uh, off my chest because I would have stuffed it up off the bat. Before we throw over to John, we're going to go to Tommy with, uh, as usual, uh, Tommy's tribute. Welcome aboard. Now, just uh, for clarification, it's it's Juan Hursan, isn't it? Oh, no. Hang on. Yeah, no, that's right. Juan Hursan. Okay. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> He's a speaker and a writer. He's known all around the world. He's ripped and he's got no hair. Dr. John has been certified by the N-fucking-S-C-A This isn't much that the man hasn't done But what it all comes down to Is that girls really like him and they don't like me Cause I got one hand in my pocket And the other one is scrolling through his website in a sexual way Welcome, Dr. John. Man, what an intro. Whoa. In a sexual way. In a sexual way. Sexual way. Oh, that's great. Uh, you've, um, you've been on with the tributes yeah, over the last, oh, <laughs> the last yeah, couple. Yeah. You are, oh, my friend. Yeah, I'm on, I'm on. Um, John, welcome, uh, welcome to the show. Man, it's good to be here, guys. Cool, cool. cool. Um, all right, why don't, you, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, John, and uh, introduce kind of who you are and what it is that you do. Yeah, so I'm a sports performance specialist um, out of Madison, Wisconsin, and we work with athletes all around the world, uh, not only here in our office, but remotely. And uh, really, my big platform is my website, drjohnrusson.com, is where we produce a ton of our articles, 
uh, on the pain-free performance model along with just smart training methodologies. So that's what we're up to. Okay, beautiful. So um, what got all this started in your life? What, where did the, uh, the want to be in sports performance, physical therapy, um, the health and fitness basically, where did that all come from? Man, I was born into it because my parents were kind of into the industry. Uh, they were professors and my, my dad was an athletic director. So grew up playing a lot of sports, uh, being very serious about it. When I hit 15 or 16, I, I started in the weight room for the first time. Just really loved it and knew that's what I wanted to do. That's where I wanted to spend my time and energies. And really, I took it from there. Okay. Cool. So, what cool. was your mm. what was your main kind of training background when you were going through school and stuff? Did you play any any uh, Did you do any college sport, or did you have any sports that you just that were your your thing, or did you just kind of float through and test them all out as kids like like I kind of and Tommy, I suppose, kind of did. tended to, yeah. <laughs> Well, well, not to toot my own horn here, but I was pretty toot good away, high school athlete. Toot away, man. toot away. We, we will so, toot ours at some point, so <laughs> I'll probably toot your horn. <laughs> so I, I played uh, I played three sports in high school. So I played basketball, baseball, and football. Uh, baseball was really my good one. Uh, basketball was really good at as well. But ended up playing uh, Division One baseball, you know, in college, and really doing pretty well at that level, you know, just for. Uh, just for everything that was going on. You know, I'm in Buffalo, New York, which is where I grew up. And it like snows there into the into the spring season. And baseball is a spring sport. So usually not a whole lot of people come out of Buffalo playing division one baseball. So that was kind of what got me going in the athletic performance side of things. But really I had some good coaching early on, you know, guys that really appreciated good movement. Uh, they taught from the ground up. It wasn't the current youth sports model where we're just trying to push too much on the kids too quickly. And really that, uh, that just gave me a good foundation to go through university, go into grad school, you know, just get more and more experience coaching athletes mm. and, you know, just taking it to the next level. Mm. Awesome. So um, did you, let's, let's, um, let's be honest about it. Like how, how close did you get to the, um, to the, to the majors or to the, cause you would go, is it in the, in, in baseball, is it, um, is it college, minor leagues, major leagues? Is that basically the three steps? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. That's pretty much it. Um, so I was close. A lot of people in America they come out and uh, if they're really good out of high school, they'll go r- directly into the minor leagues in baseball. Right. And gotcha. I was actually just an injury waiting to happen like my entire life, which kind of leads me to what I'm doing now. But my senior year of a baseball in high school, you know, I was really good. I was on a, you know, I was out scouting for many, many different teams uh, for the draft. And then I ended up having a major sh- uh, elbow injury that really kept me from doing anything my entire senior year. You know, I still signed my scholarship and went uh, and played in college. But in three years later, fast forward, I have another elbow injury. And that ended up being uh, the last game I ever played. So you know, I, I was literally taken off the field injured and I never oh, played again. Yeah. And what what a bummer. Were you a pitcher? Is that like a pitcher's injury or a or a what type what type of elbow? Is that a common injury? Yeah, it is a common injury, but uh mine's a little less common. So the first time uh, I tore my UCL, it's like a ligament in your elbow. It's most uh, notoriously known for like Tommy John surgery. So people that go in and have Ulnar, ulnar collateral ligament surgery is like Tommy John surgery. So it's super common now. Mm. But the first time I did it throwing, I'm actually an outfielder. And then the second time was just a fluke injury. It was just on a really bad field uh, in college. And it was a rainy day. It was cold. And I dove in the outfield, got my arm under me, and just had the same exact injury again, which was kind of a bummer at the time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I could imagine. I, I had a friend... Um I think it's really easy to have those recurring injuries once you've done them, done them once. I had a friend who was quite a talented Australian rules footballer and maybe could have got drafted and he kept having shoulder um, shoulder trouble where he would pop his shoulder out and he called me one day distraught because he had to get another shoulder reconstruction and, and the last time, I couldn't help but laugh, the last time was from swatting a fly off the back of his head <laughs> and his shoulder just popped out. So um, yeah, the recurring injuries, that's a bummer. How did that all, like how did you... What what was that part of your life like when you kind of had to pull up the um or hang up the uh, hang up the gloves? It, it was it was kind of a blessing in disguise to be absolutely honest because 
you know, I was good, but it wasn't to the level like I was going to be a professional for 20 years in Major League Baseball or anything like yeah. that. Mm, yeah. So I got hurt and I ended up just finishing up the semester. You know, I always had really, really good grades. Uh, academics was always like a strong suit of mine. So I was in exercise science at the time. And after the semester was over, uh, I went and met with uh, some of my academic people at the college. And they're like, so, John, um, I, I think you have like enough credits to graduate and this was uh, three years in at the time. Mm. So I was like, holy shit, I do? Yeah. <laughs> so they're like, well, you can either, you know, uh, just keep on uh, going to school in undergrad and you can like try to redshirt and come back and play baseball yep. or you can just graduate. So I was like, well, fuck, man, like fuck I'm kiss. just going to graduate and see what's out there. So yep. I ended up doing that, taking my first coaching job. Um, and then the year after that, moving back into grad school, continuing to coach and continuing to do what I'm doing today. Cool. So, like so when you say um, when you say coaching, is that um, was it? It wasn't sports specific coaching. You just went into a straight um, kind of strength and conditioning background, or where did it all start with you with all of your coaching? Yeah, I've never been a sport coach. It's always been strength and conditioning for me. Yep. Um, I took my first client on a, when I was in school, sophomore in college. So I was 19 years old, and uh, you know, a couple months ago, I came up on a decade in the industry from training my first client. So, you know, it's been 10 years of uh, training athletes in the weight room and strength and conditioning. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, and then, okay, what is it today that um, um, that gets you most passionate and most fired up? Like, where's your where's your um, your passion in the industry right now? It's definitely on injury prevention. Uh, mm -hmm. Every single thing that we do, if I go out and speak or if I write an article, uh, if I'm on a podcast like this one, you know, that's our big mission is to train smarter to prevent injuries before they ever happen. And, you know, there's not a 110% guarantee that we can ever prevent all injuries, but there's just some low hanging fruit that it's negligent not to go down that rabbit hole and address these things. Because, you know, people like me, they get hurt and they're injury prone for a reason, you know, trying to prevent that kind of thing from happening, not only in athletes, but even in like general fitness population. That's a really big thing because the last five, six years in the industry has taught me that every single person is hurt. They don't even know it yet. So people are just so used to feeling shitty all the time that they don't know what it is to go in, go for a run pain-free or mm. bench press pain-free because it's just the minutia of the same old shit. And when you really show people what they're able to do without pain, like it's a huge light bulb that goes off in their mind. And this translates really well into high-performance sport, but it also mm -hmm. translates well into just daily living. So having that yeah. vision is just a huge for us. So mm. what do you see some of the most um, reasons as to why people are injured or, or hurt all the time? Is it mobility, uh, strength, or, or what, what are we typically saying? Uh, that's, a, that's a hard question to answer because I think everyone's an individual. They have individual presentations. But if I were to say like a vast majority of people were hurt all the time because I just think they are inherently weak. And I know that sounds harsh, but we've gone through the last 10 years in our industry where we're trying to fix everybody. We're trying to fix everyone's pain and their mobility problems by doing things like more stretching, more foam rolling, more corrective exercise. And really, I see a shift in the industry now of really we want to work on developing strength and capacities in the foundational movement patterns. So, you know, the big key movements. And if we can do that and we can maintain those movement patterns, that is what's going to keep us healthy. That's going to be what really uh, gives us longevity to our physicality and our training career. And that's something that we really focus a ton on now. Well, I think, I think for me personally, because I'm, um, I'm riding to the old uh, CrossFit, and um, I don't know why I said it like that. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do I. Yeah, <laughs> but I think for me, the biggest thing was um, just honing in the, uh, the correct biomechanics. Bill, that one. Sorry, um, I just can't stop Honing in on the, uh, the correct biomechanics, but also to... Um, when I started to understand, you know, the, the body is kind of its um, best and, and worst friend because it's gonna, it's just gonna work on on the strongest muscle around. And if just by by way of poor biomechanics, you've you've developed a muscle that's not meant to take that load. It's just gonna use it, and use it, and use it. And I'm talking, for example, when my lower back, my QLs were overdeveloped. Um, 
more over my, my glute strength. I just had to really dial in that, you know, that the sort of unilateral exercises. And I think, I think biomechanics for me and strengthening up those little muscles or um, the muscle I had to use more really helped me. But um, do you see, I'm, I guess I'm sort of asking a question now in a, in a more sport related um, context. Do you see um, more, more of the same sort of injuries um, in different sports or what sort of sports do you work with? So I've, uh, I've coached professional athletes here in America in nine of our major sports, uh, multiple gold medal level Olympians. Um, so I see a bunch of different kind of people, but I like that you said CrossFit because, uh, lately, you know, we're in the midst of the CrossFit open right now. So, you know, we definitely see a lot of the coaches and the higher end athletes locally that are coming in trying to stay fresh after the open. But you know, people come in with a bunch of different um, sport-related injuries, but I really see like one of the biggest determining factors to staying healthy is just having like a base of foundational practices. So like mm. the people that sleep well, they eat well, uh, you know, they have like a good physical movement capacity, their stress level isn't crazy. Those people really do well if they have minor flare-ups. You know, mm. they can come in, they can get well in one or two sessions or just changing a movement pattern a little bit. Yep. But the people who struggle have no real good appreciation for like those bases of foundations. So like, you know, if you sleep one hour a night, <laughs> it's going to be really, really hard to get you healthy. Uh, you know, if you eat like total shit, it's really going to be hard to expedite the recovery process. Yes. You know, just, just that uh, the simple stuff that people – almost neglect because it is so simple. Those are things that uh, if people have those dialed in, you know, even if they do have injuries and flare ups, like they're far less severe. But, you know, really like uh, with our Western societies, we look at like three major areas uh, of pain and dysfunction, like looking at the lower back and the shoulders. Those are really the top two you know, lower back 20 years ago would be number one by far. But as we've seen in our, especially in our active populations, just shoulder dysfunction and pain, uh, it's huge, especially in barbell sport. So mm. those two, and then it's kind of a split between like lower limb dysfunction between like hips and knees. And that's more like chronic based stuff. Usually you don't see people coming in with huge injuries, huge traumatic base injuries in the gym or on the field uh, with those two. But Really, when you're looking at like preventable stuff, like lower backs and shoulders, that's it's a lot of opportunity to just start remediating things, uh, putting people in a better position before they ever have to go down the vicious injury cycle of shoulder and lower back pain dysfunction. So uh, are you saying, um, going back to what you mentioned before, John, is um, the, the biggest problem that we have out there is people are, people are weak. So I've had, um, I've had lower back issues and... Uh, Missed a good chunk of my competitive time over the last three or four years uh, with some disc problems and so on and so forth, and that for me was because same as Tommy basically was just was just explaining same as so many people out there was basically my glutes weren't working at all when I squatted when I did a lot of a, a lot of stuff none of it was coming from my glutes basically so when you say one of our biggest problems is that we're weak is that because um, we're weak in the places we should be strong or is that because we're weak in muscles that need to help uh, help the major movers or like when you say we're weak and we have back and shoulder issues, like where can we be stronger to alleviate those problems? It's funny because people look at strength as only a mechanical metric, like how much force can a muscle fiber create? Whereas I look at it as a combination between a mechanical uh, stimuli and neurological patterns. Mm -hmm. So if we can line things up biomechanically, arthrokinematically to be in ideal, uh, you know, positions in order to create stability, create torque at some of the big major joints, create stiffness through the spine and produce maximal amounts of force. If it's a loaded movement, then that's really my definition of strength. So you know, you can look at it a couple different ways, but you can enhance strength almost by doing anything. And as you mentioned, like the, oh, my glutes aren't firing or, hey, you need better core strength. Like those two terms are so misguided in our industry because, yeah, everyone needs like better firing glutes and everyone needs like a stiffer core. 
but just saying it's not going to do anything. Like we mm-hmm. have to actually have action behind those, uh, those pseudo diagnoses. So mm-hmm. I hear it all the time. Like people come in, oh yeah, my, my, my one leg is longer than the other one. Uh, my pelvis is out of alignment. Uh, my glutes do not fire. Like, well, I'm pretty sure your glutes fire because I have my hand on them right now. I'm asking you to contract and you're doing it. So yeah. like they are there. It's just that not everything is coordinated in a nice synergistic fashion. So coordination, smooth coordination of force production, now that's a definition of strength because it has neurological base. It has mechanical strength base. It has a skill requirement to it. It's like almost the well-rounded approach to quote-unquote strength, if that makes sense. Right. Okay. Gotcha. So, um, I just, before we go any further, I have to award you, um, (laughs) longest, uh, and greatest words or phrase that we've had on the podcast so far. Arthro (laughs) kinematically, it's, it's blown us both away. We looked, me and Tommy looked at each other and we said, what the fuck does that mean? (laughs) (laughs) And in Wisconsin. (laughs) Yeah. Um, yeah, but no, that, well, that all makes, um, that all makes, except for that fucking word. (laughs) That all makes, that all, that all makes, um, really good sense so for me when i was um when i was having the back issues it was all about um trying to and you can give us your your thoughts on this so i would spend a good portion of my warm-up or i'd spend probably 30 minutes before i touched a barbell trying to um get my glutes to work in the correct pattern so basically i do a lot of um lying on my on my stomach and um doing what you would call like a one leg superman no not clams lying on my stomach um like a one leg Superman. Yeah. So trying to get my glutes to engage before my back or my hamstrings oh, yeah. because always it would always go back hamstring glute like it would do it in the wrong direction. So is that yeah. what you're t- trying to talk about with the um with the neurological pathways to get the actual muscles firing in the correct sequence and that is your version of also being strong in your neurological pathways. Is is that what you're saying? Yeah, well it saddens me that you're spending a half hour working on your glutes, by the way. Saddens me, my friend. Saddens me. I could spend that time reading books, working on something off. Else. <laughs> spend that time squatting. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. What, what, we're, like, what we teach uh, in our seminars is how to prepare the pillar. So the pillar is the shoulders and the hips and the core working together as a functional unit. So it's easy to say like, oh yeah, you got to fire your glutes or you got to have better core strength. But the way that we position the body, especially with those ball and socket joints like the hips and the shoulders, it's all about something. This is another one that's going to kill you guys. The synergistic really spiral effect. Oh, so, oh, that's a good one, arthro, isn't it? I, throw, yeah. I prefer arthrokinematicism myself. But, uh, kinet- so they're, both, they're both in the same. They're both unison. So yes, gotcha. uh, arthrokinematics. So it's like the, the fine uh, a positioning of a joint just to get it perfect in a, a something called centration. So like straight in the sack dab in the middle of a joint. So it, we can spiral better if we have centration at joints. So if the joint is central in the joint, We can Mm -hmm. actually spiral the tissues, the stabilizing muscles around that joint in order to unlock strength potential, unlock torque. So that's really what we focus on is trying to teach our athletes how to create torque and stability at the shoulders and hips. Mm. So it becomes inherently more easy to actually put uh, some tension through the core and get spinal stiffness that can translate into any movement that you're looking at, not only gym-based movement, but field and court sport movement as well. So Mm. we almost look at it as um, it's almost a skill to start knowing how to stabilize the joints, how to prep the pillar. And this isn't something that takes a whole lot of time. It's just using um, the correct corrective exercises, the correct sequences, the correct soft tissue and uh, the correct activation drills in order to get an elicited response. So yeah, okay. When we okay. when we go down, we we do like uh, six to eight minutes to prepare our athletes to train. That's it. But that really takes a, it takes a lot of time to really fine tune what the goal is for the warm up session. So you know it's really individualistic in nature. But every single person would do better. They would train more pain free, and they'd have better performance under the bar if they learned how to prepare and stabilize the pillar better. Okay. So just for the listeners out there, 
uh, and for myself and Tommy. So we're right across this. I know it's a very indoor, uh, individualized um, program that you would give someone in their warm up, but in a six minute warm up for say say for me, um, and we're not going to use me. Um, as the actual example, because you don't know how I move, but say I'm poorly, going for a heavy, very, very poorly. <laughs> <laughs> say I'm going for a heavy back squat day, and you want to warm my, you want to warm me up so that my um, back's going to be safe. My biomechanically, I'm going to move well, and everything's going to be firing in the right position. Like, use one of your athletes as an example. What mm. What would you say? Like, because six minutes is a very short warm up, but if you think it's the way to go, like, how would you? What would you? program or use any any athlete that you've got for an example for a six minute perfect warm-up well we break it down into the same type of blueprint that we use for our dynamic warm-up sequences so it's the six phase sequence so those six phases the first one we go through soft tissue work Mm -hmm. second phase we get into dynamic stretching third phase corrective exercise fourth phase activation drills Fifth phase, we're actually going to practice the foundational movement pattern that we're going after, which is the Mm -hmm. squat in this example. Mm -hmm. And then the sixth phase, maybe the most important phase, is to heighten the central nervous system and stimulate that thing so we can actually get a better performance under the bar when we get to our big power or strength-based movements. So for the squat, many people uh, were posturally piss poor. Mm -hmm. PPP. Yeah, right. I (laughs) like it. We need work on two major areas. We need to work on the hip flexors, both the superficial and the deep hip flexors. So we're talking about like the quads and like the ilioso as like that deep hip flexor. So we're trying to open that up. If you look on the opposite side of the body, we're just trying to improve activation there. So we're looking at hamstrings, glutes off of a strong and stable core unit. From there, you know, from like a corrective exercise standpoint, really opening up that thoracic spine that's a really high yielding place to be doing some work because the better movement and stability that we can have at end range at the thoracic spine, the better that our shoulders are going to move, but also the more stress that we can take off that lower back. Because if Mm -hmm. we, we have no movement happening at the thoracic spine, you know, the movement comes from somewhere else. And Mm -hmm. usually it travels down that kinematic chain and it ends up at the lower back where we really don't want to have any unwanted movement happening there. But mm. this is a key point that we have a two-minute block of foundational movement pattern development in the dynamic warm-up. So if you're going to squat that day, we're going to have a two-minute block where I don't give a shit how many reps you do. I would just want you to do body weight squats in like a block-based practice scheme. So literally you have the time and the energy and the emphasis to think about your movement quality. And just work on one to two key things that, you know, help you out in terms of cueing or setup. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to go into the squat rack, you know, with a bar on your back and think about your form when you're just trying to, you know, move with uh, maximal velocity or just trying to move max weights. Mm -hmm. So really, we put the, the emphasis on trying to fix movement and correct movement before we ever get into training. And if we do our job correctly in that six phase sequence, then it just uh, it translates into better pain-free performance when we're actually in the training session itself. But I guess getting to that last, uh, the sixth phase, the CNS prep, we do things like jumps, like jacks and throws. You know, mm-hmm. those are the big ones. Even uh, if, it's, uh, it's, if it's an athlete that we're working with, we'll do short duration sprints just for the acceleration right. mechanics as well. But this, this stuff, it has to be fine-tuned because Again, our goal is six to eight minutes and that's it. And if you do that all well, you're going to be not only warming up to prevent injuries, but you're also going to enhance your performance as well. Mm, Absolutely. Well, that sounds great. That sounds a lot better than the 30 minutes that I would uh, would do. I'm a terrible- I see it a lot. I see it a lot, the drawn out. Yeah. yeah, and, and, um, And it's just really hard to be motivated to- get in the gym and spend oh, 30 minutes beforehand. And horrendous. 30, uh, I've been um, a weightlifter the last few years. So adding a, so my sessions would be two, two and a half hours, reg, uh, n- irrespective of what I have to do in the warm up and, uh, and warm down basically. So yeah, I think the fact that you've uh, packaged it into a six, eight minute format's great because I mean, people have lives unless you're an elite athlete. You have to be able to warm the body up, get in, do the work, and get out, and still go cook dinner and wash the car and um, <laughs> wash paint, the dinner and paint play, the fence, cook the car, yeah, cook the horse, yeah, cook the horse, um, yeah. walk the walk the house, but play, um, the, play the dog, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, all right, cool. So, and what about um, 
And what about, let's talk about, um, we've just talked about, you know, how you would warm up for a, for a, a squat. What about for um, something that is an upper body centric kind of movement? So if we're talking um, uh, something very shoulder centric so that we can actually make sure that we're not going to come up with a, with a with a bung shoulder at the end of the session. What about strict press, strict barbell press? Yeah, what are the what are the key things that y- you see people missing out on there? Uh, for for like the overhead barbell press, I think mm. that is like the king of all movements. Just to identify dysfunction, because mm. really everything's got to be on point. You know, you got to have nice spinal mechanics. You have to have good hip stability. Obviously, getting into that overhead mobility based component. So it's a really good metric to look at. And trying to fine tune a, a warm up off of that, it really comes down to two things. We need activation happening through the lower body posterior chain. So we need to be activating through the glutes, integrated with the core stiffness. Mm-hmm. We have to be able to actually get into a somewhat neutral or extended base moment at that thoracic spine, similar to the squat. And really, what we're trying to do is add stability to the upper back. You know, that's a a reason why I think a vast majority of shoulder injuries happen that present with front sided shoulder pain is that our front sides of our shoulders and our chest, they get overdeveloped, uh, whether it be due to poor and faulty postures, you know, forward rounded posture in combination with just like pure strength. And really the upper back is what needs to support strength, especially in the pressing base movements. So a large, uh, you know, a two to three minute portion of that six to eight minute dynamic warm-up sequence is going to be spent on uh, shoulder-friendly back activation. So band pull-aparts, banded face pulls, band over and backs, uh, and a bunch of different derivatives of those main movement patterns. Uh, there's an, a warm-up that has like been going through the industry like the last two or three years that I wrote an article on T Nation about. It's like the quote-unquote the Russian shoulder warm-up. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a tricep between the pull apart, the over and back, and the face pull. And you do it for uh, as many reps as you can get, really with the goal of pumping as much blood flow into the shoulders as possible to lubricate the joints, to activate that upper back, just so we can support the pressing better. And that's been working wonders for a lot of people that have had some chronic base issues at the shoulders. Right. I think um, for me personally as a coach, I see a lot of people that don't have that um, that sufficient amount of sort of thoracic extension. They they tend to really overextend their lower back in an effort to to press up on the bar. Do you want to just talk to Alice about how ineffective and sort of you know injury uh, prone that can that can make someone's body? Because I think a lot of people sort of just try to get the movement out in the overhead press rather than actually you know, going home and developing on their mobility and stability and stuff like you say. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, our industry does a pretty good job at being uh, scared to fucking death of spinal flexion. Mm. But we forget that like hyper extension of the lumbar spine is probably equally as bad orthopedically. Mm. Yeah. So when we're looking at uh, injury prevention, we want to be, it doesn't have to be perfect. We don't have to have every vertebral segment in perfect alignment, but we have to be like in a neutral-ish range. And more importantly, we need to be monitoring uh, the range of motion that the spine is moving through uh, unwarranted. Mm. So if we are starting uh, with the barbell on our clavicles going into the overhead press, if we're starting in 10 degrees of lumbar lordosis, and by the time we get halfway up through the press overhead, we move into 30 degrees, that's going to be 20 yeah. degrees of relative motion that we don't want. Mm. So if we start in a more neutralized position, we can maybe end up in the same extended base position, but we can minimize the range of motion that the spine is going through under, under loading that we really don't want it to. Yes. So yes. really thinking about it doesn't have to be perfect, but if you are going to be in a, a more poorly set up position, you better be stabilizing it. And, you know, the proof is uh, world-class power lifters not always keeping neutral spines, but them just having such a great ability to stabilize through the hips, the core, and the shoulders together to integrate that functional unit and to stabilize the spine no matter what position it gets forced into. There's another thing as well with, um, because a lot of people will see like, you know, super, super huge, strong um, powerlifting dudes and chicks um, lifting insane amounts of weight. And they look at it and they go, fuck, like, they've got a, a curve in their, their thoracic spine. But it, it's, it's more the thing if you want to actually look, a, you look at um, 
change in change in the, the actual back angle as the as the bar is being moved, as opposed to seeing it from the start, which is maintained until the end. Yeah, I mean, it's a big point and it's an intricate point because people look at point A and point B. So they look at their starting position, they look at their ending position, and they forget about what happens in between. And it's usually the stuff that happens between is what predisposes you to either plateauing out your lifts or to having uh, pain and injury provocation. So it's, uh, you know, it's the power of coach's eye. It's the power of video. And it's just, again, you know, having the capacity to actually do something. And if you don't, find a movement variation that you can train pain free and you can train balls to the wall without fighting your own body in the process. Yeah, now, I wanted to uh, bring myself into it as a uh, as a case example. I I would love to hear your thoughts on this because I've been fucking like trying to get it right for ages. I've been um so whenever I pull up the floor, my back can sort of maintain um maintain a pretty good neutral position up until about I don't know 120 kilos or something. And then I would, and then I start to see a, a softening of the lower back as I start to pull off the floor. And I would just like, I, I probably, uh, I think I would have a, enough body awareness to to assume that that's just a, a weakness in my lower back. But I thought it was a, I thought it was a weakness in my glutes initially because um, they were just something wasn't going on. Then all of that weight and that load was going through to the lower back. But um, I don't know, with the amount of unilateral exercises I'm doing, given my mobility has been pretty good, I just can't seem to get it right. You're talking about for a clean or a deadlift? Oh, just, well, I mean, for both. So clean, both. clean even though I'm lower to the bar, I'll, I'll still get a softening. Mm. Um, the, the the hinge in the deadlift, I'll still see a softening, despite mm. the fact that I feel like I've got, torque, got a good torque coming through my kit. Um, well, just off that, uh, John, what, can, you, can you shed some light on <laughs> what I might be doing wrong? <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to play internet doctor, but I have yes. a lot of practice at it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, especially without any video or footage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A cue that I see a lot that's like ingrained in people's minds is uh, having like a chest up position over the barbell, uh, because people are like, "All right, I'm going to get into a neutral spine," but what they think is a neutral spine is actually an extended spine, yeah. especially with Olympic lifting. They get the chest up position, they get a head up position. And they actually just functionally break themselves in half. And it usually happens at like L2, L3, L3, L4, L4, L5, right through those segments. And again, it's like going back to the same point that we just made. If you start off in a position that you can't properly stabilize because you're out of that neutral-ish plane, then you're pulled back in and you lose your integrity of your spinal position. Which again, it's not a huge deal, but I'd rather see people uh, get more over the bar Use almost like a sternal tuck is what we cue. So almost getting into a somewhat like we're talking tiny bit here, like a 10 to 15 degree crunch down at like the xiphoid process, like that sternal notch that you have like at the bottom of your chest and just getting tighter and being able to actually generate more tension and more force output with your brace. So that will, you know, just cause you not to be falling into that flexion-based moment out of the most likely extension that you're starting off in. Well, that's, that makes a lot of sense because I, um, I have, I've typically had um, back issues. I mean, because I, I, I stand um, with a pretty aggressive anterior tilt. It's not, it's not anywhere near as bad as it was, but I used to have uh, pars fractures in my lower back just from naturally standing like that. And I had to sort of work to, to tuck under. But um, what would you say some good exercises are for people that are sort of standing in that in that tilt, in that hyper lower extension? And how can we sort of find a more neutral position? This is a funny question because there's arguments in our industry right now among experts saying that, hey, anterior tilt, posterior pelvic tilt doesn't fucking matter. You know, it doesn't correlate to performance reduction and it doesn't correlate to any incidence of increased pain. And I say to that, like, I cannot understand that because how can we not be coaching people to get more neutral, to get into better positions? At very worst, it does nothing, but it just looks better, feels better to the person. Yes. Um, But really just, it's important to say that, like, we don't need to be correcting everything. We just got to have it to a level that it's not a huge glaring issue. It doesn't present with a red flag. So if I see a new athlete that comes in to see me for like a consult and they walk in, they can't even walk straight because their anterior tilt is just so crazy. 
you know, that might be something that we'd look at. But if it's something that like a lifter would walk in and I can't even tell because he has shorts on, he has a t-shirt falling over his hips and he has the ability to you know, like brace and get tension over the barbell. Yeah. You know, that's something that I'm not too worried about because he's showing promise with the ability to brace around whatever position that his lumbar spine and his pelvis are placed into. But, you know, it all comes down to trying to normalize bracing, which comes with better, uh, more timely uh, strength happening at the anterior core, so the front side of the body, yeah. in a combination with better, more timely strength at the posterior aspect of the lower body, hamstrings plus glutes. If you look at like the cross between uh, the abs on the front side and the glutes on the back side, the cross between those two things, if we have a co-contraction happening between those things, the pelvis shouldn't be going anywhere because we're pulling anterior on one side, we're pulling posterior on the other side. That co-contraction should stabilize. Mm. And that's really the key thing is like if we can just normalize strength on both sides of the equation there and, you know, more so if, uh, you know, on the back side we can alleviate some tightness and on the front side hip flexors we can alleviate some tightness, then we just optimize the position to be better stabilized no matter what the activity that you're doing. And then we shouldn't typically see that, that lower back softening and stuff. No, it's, it's something that I definitely, if I see it and it's a red flag issue or somebody comes in seeing me saying yeah. that, hey, my back is broken from deadlifts and yeah. hey, you know, like I have a, a flex based position two inches off the ground on my deads. Yeah. That's something that we're going to definitely look at. But if they're training at pain free and they have the ability to brace around it, it's not that big a deal. But a vast majority of people, they're going to be bit by the injury bug if they put enough volume, enough frequency, enough intensity on faulty movements. John, with the um, just to touch on the bracing that you keep um, keep mentioning. So, just to to think about it um, in terms of, are we talking about if you're putting your thumb underneath your um, your chest, your ribs on your chest, or your pecs in the middle of your pecs? You put your put a finger on your uh, belly button. Are we talking about closing that distance? We're talking about shortening that distance in when we brace. Is that what we're talking about here? Yeah, you can talk about uh, shortening it slightly. Yeah. But what I use with my my clients when I come in, because it's super hard to say like subjectively, like how are you supposed to feel when you brace your abs correctly? Mm -hmm. Nobody really knows. So uh, a test that I usually go through with my people is I have them lay down on their backs with their feet on their ground so the knees are bent and I have them put their fingers like right to the outside of their abs. So they're contacting like the rectus, the internal and external obliques. Yep. And then I'm like, all right, turn on your abs, like brace hard. And then like I'm palpating as well with them mm -hmm. and they'll like turn it on to some extent. And I'm like, all right, turn them off. And then I ask them to cough. And I go, all right, put your fingers back there, cough really loud. <clears throat> and then you could see the activation, the level of activation that the abs are actually able to do. And it's a night and day difference between like thinking that you're turning on full tension and actually like uh, having your body being fooled into bracing. Mm. Right. So trying to mitigate the range between those two things, like what you're volitionally able to do and what your body kicks on automatically. If we can get those two things closer together, that is going to be the key to optimizing core stiffness. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, um, all right. So what about, um, uh, I, uh, I have a good buddy of mine, John, who's a very, um, uh, he he reads all of his stuff and he gets um gets right behind all of your blogs and stuff that you've written and he said that he wanted to uh, wanted us to talk about your um functional hypertrophy program which is yeah. basically basically what we uh for me that's all I really want you want to be functionally strong and you want to be jacked as shit yeah yeah so is this kind of your is this how you train John I I've just brought up one of your um, one of your programs I think I found on T Nation or somewhere but um. Is this is this the way that you train these days? Like you're a pretty ripped, pretty jacked, pretty strong looking dude. Yeah, oh, mate, I'm excited. Yeah, don't you worry. Yeah, th <laughs> this is exactly the way that we train, and it's the way that uh, we train our athletes as well. So the FHT, the Functional Hypertrophy Training Blueprint, and that platform, you know, it is something that we've used with high performance athletes, but we've tapered it in the last year to more like the general fitness consumer that wants to achieve the holy grail of their training results. Mm. So they're going to get strong, 
they're going to get fucking jacked, they're going to lose <laughs> fat, and they're still going to stay athletic. And most importantly, with all those factors, they're going to stay resilient against injury. So we can feel good, we can look good, we can perform like a boss, and we do it just by being a little bit more intelligent on the programming there. So we really monitor different things. Like we have very savvy dynamic warm-up sequences like we talked about programmed mm-hmm. right into FHT. We mm-hmm. have smart strength, uh, really good hypertrophy and metabolic-based stress that is really novel to most people that has a really highly yielding factor. And we condition and we do cardio like athletes, not like slaves on the treadmill. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So, um, what's an example of um, what's an example of like uh, how much hypertrophy do you put into a program where you're trying to obviously for most people maximizing functional strength is key. You want to be you want people still want performance and they want to be fit and healthy. Um, how much hypertrophy do you actually layer on top of that? It's a really good question, and um, I, I just got done with an article that will probably be out in the next couple of weeks about multiple rep ranges to elicit strength and hypertrophy simultaneously. Mm-hmm. So the more and more athletes that we train, we have an eclectic approach to programming. So we sprinkle in power schemes. We have traditional base uh, strength and hypertrophy, you know, from five to fifteen reps. But then we get into things like metabolic stress and intensity techniques that really rev up like a systemic response to training that really helps with hormone optimization and really just helps with mental acuity during training as well. So really we have a, we start every training session with like a power primer, I like to call it. It gets the body ready for performance one step above the dynamic warm up. So it's things mm-hmm. that really put uh, the body into a good position to stabilize a big strength movement from the day. From there, we go into a strength-based movement. So I like the big three. I like squat, deadlift, and bench press variations. They don't have to be only with the barbell. So we use a bunch of different uh, ways to train those movements. And from there, we really look at really just trying to get pain-free metabolic stress and hypertrophy work in. Because I'm a big believer that if we can mitigate joint stress and increase muscular stress, by getting a training response, that's how people are going to really respond best to any sort of training. And it's going to help all metrics of strength and physicality. It's going to get you strong, build muscle, lose fat, and again, keep you healthy simultaneously. So it's a, it's a hard thing to talk about, you know, achieving multiple world-class feats at once. But again, with the right program and the right focus and tensions, it's definitely possible. And we've seen it time and time again. So what about for you, John, personally? How's it helped with your with that elbow injury you had and, and maybe some other niggles you, um, you may have pushed through as well? Well, it's something that I practice what I preach. So I've been training on this model for the better uh, side of seven years, and we've been using it with our athletes for five. And it's something that if you do clean up uh, glaring weak links and you do put time, energy, and emphasis in moving well, Uh, that is the foundation that's going to create results and longevity, not for 12 weeks during the program, but it's going to give you the tools to use throughout a lifetime of your training career. So there are foundational principles that you'll have forever. And that's really one of the biggest things with FHT is it keeps on evolving, but just based on the programming, it's, it's not stuff that I just came up with yesterday. It's things that I've used with my athletes for the better part of a decade. And now, you know, it's in one program, which is really cool. And it's something that's really taken off for us because of, uh, you know, the success that it produces for people. And I couldn't be any happier with uh, the types of responses that we're getting from industry pros and athletes alike. Awesome. Hey, um, John, we have to get you out of here at some point. And before we do, we have, uh, we have six from six. So, um, are you ready for uh, are you ready for six from six? Three questions from me, three questions from Tommy. Let's do it. Okay, cool. So my first question, John, is um, what is your favorite travel destination on the planet? Your favorite holiday spot? Your favorite uh, getaway? Favorite place that you've been? Uh, South Florida. We bring the the family down there a couple times a year. I have two young kids, uh, eighteen month old son and a seven year old daughter. Bringing them to the beach and the pool is the best. So I have good memories from there. Awesome. Awesome. Um, okay, so second question, similar vein, but somewhere that you haven't been. So your absolute number one dream destination. Oh, man, that's a good one. I'm pretty well traveled as we travel a lot with our seminar series, but 
I'm really looking forward to going to Europe this year. And we're, we're running a seminar in Poland uh, with Coach Christian Thibodeau in September. So I've never been to that area of the world. I've been in other parts of Europe. But Poland's supposed to be something that's going to be like exquisite. So hopefully it, it delivers. <laughs> cool, man. That's very exciting. And uh, lastly from me, what um, do you have any books that you like to recommend to people? They can be any sort of a read. They can be... Uh, they can be fiction, they can be a biography, they can be a graphic novel, anything. Uh, you know, uh, Essentialism is a great book if you're just looking at kind of getting away from the industry minutia and just kind of looking back and making sure that you're putting first things first. Um, that's a great book that I, I read once, probably once a year, if not once cool. every two years, just to kind of get my head right on some of the business and coaching endeavors that we're in. So I highly recommend that one. Nice one. Beautiful. Hey, uh, Johnny, what do you like to do when you have some spare time or downtime? <laughs> downtime is hard to come by these days. Two kids, three <laughs> businesses. Uh, it's pretty tough, but my wife and I, like, we like to watch movies. So that's something cool. that, like, after coaching people all day, both of us, we're like, all right, we don't want to talk to anyone and we just want to, like, watch something Chill without, out. like, literally blinking. And yeah. we'll do that for two hours and then go to bed. So that's oh, yeah. something that we've really liked, so... We'll we'll do uh, we'll do the new movies that come out like on Redbox. I don't know if you guys have that in Australia, but we'll yeah, like Netflix, Netflix and all that yeah. stuff. But uh, yeah, that's like our biggest pastime. Beautiful. Hey, uh, what about someone that you really looked up to? So like an inspiration as a kid, or someone you look up to now? Man, I'm lucky to report that uh, you know one of my biggest mentors, somebody that I learned so much from in the last ten years. I'm going to be traveling with doing two day seminars this year with a 2017 world tour, which is Christian Thibodeau. Oh, so sick. Chris, Chris is an unbelievable coach. Uh, cool. He's a walking, talking encyclopedia of training and nutrition. And he's somebody, the more time I spend with him on uh, this seminar tour, the more I'm just impressed. Usually people, when you get to know them better, you're like, oh man, this guy isn't as awesome as I thought. Yeah. You know, Chris is the polar opposite. So he uh, he keeps on getting better and better and keeps on refining his craft and it's something amazing to see and continue to learn from. Hey guys, uh, coming down to, to Australia? We should, we'd love to have you on the show in person. We, we, we are planning um, late in the year, so okay. it's either going to be uh, November or December. We're going to be hitting three cities in Australia. There's no dates yet, but tentatively it's going to be Perth, Sydney, and Melbourne. Beautiful. Nice one. Because we are from Melbourne, so that'll be good. We'll, um, we'll eat some burgers, eat some sugar, <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll talk about drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, finally, John, um, if you could invite three people dead or alive to dinner, who would they be and why? Oh, man. These are, these are tough questions. These are tough. We don't muck around, mate. We don't muck around around here. <laughs> three people dead or alive. Um, <laughs> Shit, man. I, I'd like to get Trump in a room just to talk to him. <laughs> so he'd be probably one just to, just from a pure entertainment yeah. standpoint. Yeah. Um, I'd like to get Arnold in a room with Trump. That would be pretty cool. Oh, that'd be a great one. Oh, man. Who would be the last one? That would – shoot. I don't know. Uh, it would have to be like a movie star of some sort, somebody like super mysterious. Uh, hmm. I don't really know, like mysterious. the Rock, maybe just because he's <laughs> the <jacked>. Rock, <laughs> <laughs> just because he's jacked. But but you you have to you have to uh, you're allowed to sit at the table, but you're not allowed to be wearing a shirt, and because um, you're only here because you're jacked. <laughs> yeah, Trump, you're wearing a you're wearing a Hessian sack over your whole body, man. <laughs> uh, well, that's great, Johnny. Thanks a lot, mate. Um, finally, if uh, people want to find uh, find you online or um, on your social medias, where can where can people do that? Yeah, everything's on my site. So drjohnrussin.com, D-R-J-O-H-N-R-U-S-I-N.com. Over there, you can find uh, the FHT program. Uh, if you just go forward slash FHT, you'll find the landing page. You'll read a bunch of cool testimonials from coaches that you most likely read their articles in the industry that have coached with us. And all of my social media handles are over there as well. So Instagram, Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. Cool. And uh, for all our Australian listeners, that's Dr. Juan Rosa. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, John. Well, uh, thanks a lot for taking the time to come on the show, my friend. 
Man, it was awesome. Uh, it was a really fun time. Beautiful. All righty. Cool. Well, we'll get you back on again soon. And for, sure. uh, for everybody else, that's a wrap. All righty, guys. We hope you enjoyed that episode of Adventure Fit Radio. Quickly go through the sponsors again. Head to www.quashcreative.com. Mention Adventure Fit Radio and Sean will give you a free basic SEO report on your website or feedback on your existing brand. Audible. Head to www.audibletrial.com. Get a free credit when you when you use the code word radio. Uh, get a book, get some knowledge, and finally, gang, Adventure Fit Travel. Head to www.adventurefittravel.com. Have a look at all things Adventure Fit. Keep up to date with what Bill and I and the other staff are up to. Um, meet some amazing people on a trip. It's all inclusive. Obviously, meet amazing people is inclusive off the trip. And finally, guys, I love you. See you next week. Leave us a rating and review. Bye. Discovery Roger, go for deploy.